Dr. Mm -hmm. Juan uh, Martinez Cruzado uh, is, um, uh, well, I you wrote a very extensive bio, so I'm trying to kind of uh, link it to uh, why I was very interested in inviting you for our seminar today. Uh, as some of people in the department know, I've been working with the Genomics Education Partnership uh, that is focused on how do we actually educate students in uh, genomics. And Dr. Juan Martinez Cruzado is setting up a new project for that uh, national group of educators uh, uh, centered on uh, the genome of the Puerto Rican parrot. Uh, so that's how I know of Dr. Juan Martinez Cruzado. I've worked a little bit on the project. It's it's fascinating, and I'm very excited for everyone to learn more about it. But other uh, credentials for Dr. Martinez Cruzado is that he's uh, he coordinated, he directed the blood sample collection in Puerto Rico for the Thousand Genome Project, which is uh, was a massive effort to uh, you know, broaden our uh, understanding of human genomics, which is a mass is and has been a massive undertaking. Uh, there's more beyond this, but I'm going to let Dr. Juan Martinez Cruzado start and uh, tell us more about uh, the Puerto Rican Parrot Project. Sure, thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, and thank you for for being here. Uh, the Puerto Rican Parrot is the smallest of all Amazons. Uh, its height is about uh, 11 inches only, and it is the only, uh, the single only parrot that is endemic to any territory under the U.S. jurisdiction, and it is critically endangered. Uh, in the, if you look at, at Spanish crown documents of the 16th century, it's clear that uh, Spanish uh, were, uh, well, uh, all by the amount of parrots that were in Puerto Rico at that time, even though the parrots are very hard to spot in a in a in a in a forest. Uh, however, the number of parrots diminished quickly during the 19th century. During the 19th century, it is said that it was the, the second colonization of Puerto Rico. There were many people who, who came to Puerto Rico. Uh, the the population size of Puerto Rico increased 13 fold during that century, and it was mostly an agrarian society. So uh, deforestation was widespread, and uh, the Puerto Rican parrot lost its its habitat, uh, and became confined to the only uh, rainforest that there is in Puerto Rico, uh, which is shown here in blue, is the Caribbean National Forest. And in the 1930s, however, uh, there, there started a very strong forestation program in Puerto Rico. However, the new forests were, or the Caribbean National Forest was isolated from these new forests. And in addition, uh, the Puerto Rican parrots nest on hollow trunks. And hollow trunks can be found in old forests, not in young forests. So the parrot uh, remains circumscribed to the Caribbean National Forest. And it is a rainforest, and it's not the best environment for the Puerto Rican parrot. So the numbers kept diminishing. They went down to only 13 individuals by 1975. And at that point, uh, the, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service started a parrot recovery program. They captured all the birds, and they started breeding them uh, in captivity. Uh, they quickly found that the Puerto Rican, uh, so so they so all the Puerto Rican parrots that are uh, existing existing today, they all come from less than thirteen individuals. And something they quickly found is that uh, the the mothers were not good mothers. They were not uh, incubating properly their eggs, and in addition, uh, the. The males are the ones who feed the fledglings, and they were not doing that properly either. So they decided to raise also the Hispaniola parrot to use them as surrogate parents of the Puerto Rican parrot. And by raising the Hispaniola parrots, they found that the eggs of the Puerto Rican parrots were breaking at the rate five times the, uh, the rate of the Hispaniola parrot. So it seems that there's a problem with the with the hardness, with the strength of the actual of the Puerto Rican parrot. 
uh, we hypothesize that uh, the severe bottleneck uh, that we Puerto Rican part went through uh, raised the frequency of some slightly deleterious mutations that are affecting actual strength. This is a, a table um, about the size of the genomes of different birds. You can see that the size does not change a lot. It goes from 1.0 to 1.23 gigabases. Um, uh, the smallest uh, genomes are from the chicken and also the passerie forms. Now we have to we have, we have to uh, pay attention to the passerie forms because they are the order that is more closely related to the cetacean forms, which are the parrots. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, genomes are the ones from the oldest branch, the ratites. They are the uh, walking <laughs> birds, and. Uh, and, and probably that genome sizes are underestimated because it, uh, you know, when you sequence the genomes, you don't get all the tandem repeats. Now it's changing now with the nanopore ultra long reads that can uh, read uh, along uh, tandem repeats. Also, the PAC Bio Hi Fi results complex regions. And there's also the chromatin conformation capture sequencing, right? They call it as Hi C. Now, now you can do telomere to telomere sequencing. And uh, uh, there was a recent paper in PNAS where Wang and company uh, sequenced uh, telomere to telomere the genome of the chicken. That was in PNAS. And uh, uh, the numbers that you see in red in this table are from that, uh, from that paper. So the size of the chicken genome increased from 1.04 to 1.1. Interestingly, the deployed number was lower to 78. Uh, if you go right now to NCBI genome, you will find that the, uh, it, it is showing you 39 uh, autosome pairs plus one pair of sex chromosomes for a chicken. The cetaciformes, the parrots, uh, they have a very constant genome size according to this table from 1.13 to 1.16. Now the, the sauropods, those are the amniotes that are not the mammals, that are not mammals, they are egg-laying amniotes. Uh, they, they all have a similar karyotypes in the sense that it can be divided into macro chromosomes and micro chromosomes. This is the chicken karyotype. We are using the chicken as a, as a model organism. And uh, uh, what, what you had in the chicken is that the macro chromosomes, uh, six of them, there are 10 macro chromosomes, and six of them are metacentric or sub metacentric. There are two that are subtelocentric, and there are two that are acrocentric. Okay. Now, when you go to the microchromosomes, they are all agrocentric with one exception. Chromosome 11 is subterocentric. And in these uh, microchromosomes, each one of them uh, with, with three exceptions, sorry, there are three exceptions, the chromosome 27, 33, and 38. Uh, with these three exceptions, all of them have these 41 base pair CNM, CNM tandem repeats. And that also happens with uh, chromosomes, uh, with macro chromosomes six and nine. That is, so these tandem repeats appear only in agrocentric chromosomes. I, and it doesn't matter if the chromosome is a macro or a micro. Or, 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 or a micro. So, uh, so uh, the presence of this CNM and tandem repeats is dependent not on chromosome size, but on the position of the centromere so that they are present only in acrocentric chromosomes. There are some acrocentric chromosomes that do not have them, but they are present in only acrocentric chromosomes. And that's interesting because the, uh, the ancestral uh, chordate uh, had only acrocentric chromosomes. So it's very possible that these CNM tandem repeats represent the ancestral condition, the ancestral state, and they may be very stable. If you go to the macro chromosomes that are metacentric or subcentric, and you look at the tandem repeats associated to their centromeres, they are chromosome specific, and they may have a reason from the uh, fusions, chromosome fusions after the whole genome duplications. Uh, now, more recently, the micro chromosomes have been have been divided into dot chromosomes, which are shown here in D with a D and microchromosomes. The dot chromosomes should not be confused with Drosophila dot chromosomes. They are very different. Uh, these, uh, all these dot chromosomes are agrocentric. 
They are all very small, less than 3.5 megabases. Uh, they can be divided into two compartments. One is uh, about 60% about 60 of the dot chromosomes uh, are, oh, I got an, are you seeing me? I, I have I got a note that my internet is being unstable. We, we see you. See me, okay, thank you. So the, the, the compartments, 60% uh, of the micro, of the dot chromosomes, sorry, are euchromatin and they uh, are rich in genes. And then 40% is pericentric heterochromatin, which uh, surprisingly has many copies of, uh, of, many duplicated copies of protein coding genes. The genes in the dot chromosomes uh, tend to be, uh, tend to have a widespread uh, expression along many tissues and also to be highly expressed. And uh, in difference to uh, to all, well, the, and also the gene density, the gene density is uh, about the same that microchromosomes uh, and is uh, more dense than in macrochromosomes. But those chromosomes are different to all other type of chromosomes in that they are they have a higher GC content, they have a, a higher repeat content, they have a higher DNA methylation level and they have a higher uh, three methylations of uh, H3K9, even though they express their genes uh, uh, very, very a lot. Uh, they also have lower three methylation levels of H3K36, and they have lower methylation level, levels of the uh, uh, polycom <clears throat> signal H3K27. Um, a, dot chromosome 34 is the biggest of all of them. And it is bigger than the smallest of the microchromosome, which is chromosome 25. This is basically because chromosome 25 is very small. It's a, it's a, it's a microchromosome that is very small. The next smallest is chromosome 22. Now, in this phylogeny, uh, uh, I, I want to point out that the uh, passery forms are here, okay, and the uh, theta C forms are right here, okay. So they, they are close. They are, you know. Comparatively speaking, they are closely related. And uh, the, uh, the apostrophes uh, correspond to the, to the uh, species that were sequenced in a paper by Juan et al. It's a nature paper that was uh, last year, I think. And so they sequenced the uh, four parrots. They sequenced two uh, songbirds. And they also sequenced the genome of the chicken and of the emu. And uh, they had, uh, this was telomere to telomere sequencing. And then they compared uh, chromosomal rearrangements. And you can see that over here, you have the two passeriforms, you have your chicken emu, and then these four are all parrots. Um, and so when you look at the non-parrot species, you see that there are very few chromosomal rearrangements, right? You can see, well, uh, the, chicken, the chicken is the model organism here. Uh, chicken chromosome one was divided into two chromosomes, uh, chicken, uh, chromosome four uh, was also uh, divided here in the amu. Uh, in the chicken chromosome uh, 25 became fused to chromosome 20 in the great teeth. Okay, and that's about it. But but when you come to oh, I'm very uh, we come when you come to the parrots, you have all this uh, all, all this huge amount of uh, chromosomal rearrangements. Uh, interestingly, the chromosome 11. Uh, became fused to the sex chromosome, to both chromosome Z and chromosome W. Uh, and they did some uh, studies uh, analyzing the interactions between the chromatin domains that lie at both sides of each fusion point. And they found uh, insignificant interactions between them. So they uh, concluded that these uh, large amount of rearrangements were not driven by positive selection. Uh, they found also that, uh, in general, the parrots have a lower diploid numbers than the rest of the birds. The rest of the birds have a fairly constant diploid numbers ranging from 76 to 82, and the parrots uh, are lower. The bogerigar, for example, have a diploid number of 62. Uh, uh, the blue-fronted Amazon uh, has a diploid number of 70. They also found uh, that uh, all parrots were missing 74 genes. 
And among those 74 genes that they were missing is ALC1. This is chromodomain helicase DNA binding protein like one. Uh, and they are also missing PARP3. They are both uh, involved in DNA repair and genome stability. Okay, ALC1 is a, a chromatin remodeler. It is involved in chromatin relaxation uh, during a DNA end resection. And PARP uh, is a, it's a sensor of a nuc nucleotides. And it is involved in the uh, in repair of double strand breaks. And in avian cells, it has been found also to be involved in single strand breaks. So uh, the fact that these two genes are missing in the parrots is, you know, it probably is a factor in that, that is important in, in, in the for the, for, there's a big reason why there are many uh, chromosomal rearrangements in, among parrots. Uh, ALC1 locus uh, has been broken uh, in parrots by an inversion. Uh, it, it, the, the, one of the breakpoints of the inversion is right where the ALC1 uh, locus is. Uh, PARP3 uh, has become a, a, a uh, as, uh, uh, sorry, I think I'm, a, I'm making I'm making the way, the way around. LC1 has been okay. Part three is in the breakpoint. LC1 has been pseudogenized, and a ALC1 uh, is been uh, pseudogenized in because we can say that because it has lost many exons, and in in its place it has a, it has several copies. I should put here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it has several copies of a new retroposome. It's a non-LTR retroposome. It is called CR1 PSI, PSI for Cetacidae. So it is part of specific. And it belongs to the subfamily E of chicken repeat one. Uh, in the parrot, uh, okay, CR1, CR1 PSI, as I said, is part of specific. And it, it, is, it accounts for about half of all uh, CR1s in the parrots. Parrots have a higher repeat content than other bears. Other bears' uh, genomes are like 8% repeat. Parrots are like 10%. So the larger amount of CR1 PSI, or the presence of CR PSI and the large amount of them, it may have provided substrate for ectopic recombination. And that, together with the absence of ALC1 and Part 3, may explain why you have so many, uh, so many chromosomal rearrangements in the parrots. Uh, this is Ingrid Rivera Pagan. She was a master student of mine. Uh, she she did a karyotype count in the Puerto Rican parrot, and uh, she found a diploid number equal to 76. That's interesting because the blue-fronted Amazon, that's a diverged from the Puerto Rican parrot only seven million years ago as a diploid number of 70. Uh, we sequenced the, uh, by, by the Lumina method, uh, the parallel genome, uh, and we have a, a, we made the assembly using the Alpath programs. Uh, each nucleotide was a sequence uh, on an average of 95, 95 times. N50 was over just two megabases. Uh, we had a genome uh, uh, with about 7.43% repeats that surely is underestimated. Now we know that it should be like 10%. But well, we did find that uh, the biggest group is our lines, right? Non-LTR non transposome. And there are about 18,000 protein colleges. We had, we had about uh, 6,000 scaffolds. And Ingrid did blood alignment uh, at, uh, of each end of these scaffolds. All scaffolds that were at least 40,000 base pairs, she took them. And she uh, made blood alignments of the ends of these scaffolds against the chicken genome. And she found that 51 of them started with sequences belonging to one chromosome of the chicken and ending with uh, sequences of another chromosome. Uh, so, so she searched for the putative fusion points of these, uh, of these uh, uh, fusions. Um, of course, these could be misassemblies. Well, they could be real translocations. So, uh, so, so she looked for the purely uh, fusion points, 
And she also looked for uh, con evolutionary conserved sequences that were flanking these fusion points uh, to design primers to amplify and confirm these fusions in the Puerto Rican paros and in related species. And she was able to amplify on five occasions. Most of the times the conserved uh, sites were very far apart. It was, it was almost impossible to do any PCR anyway. So, but, but in, in some occasions she was able to, to do so. And uh, she did in the, in, 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 in the Puerto Rican parrot, in three other Amazons as well. She worked also with the African gray, with the scarlet macaw, with the blue and gold macaw, with the zebra finch, and with the chicken. And uh, the results are summarized here, where all five uh, translocations that she could confirm uh, are, as long as she could tell, they were parrot specific. Uh, three of them are leading to the lineage, uh, parrot lineage, and two of them are specific to the Amazons. Uh, interestingly, in the, in the recent paper of one company, uh, they found a total of 38 chromosomal rearrangement in parrots. 32 of them were specific to a single parrot. They, they sequenced four parrots. Uh, so 32 of them were specific to a single parrot. And they, they found three fusions that were common to, they were shared by all four species. And one of them was a fusion be, between chromosomes six and seven, and another one was be, between fusions, chromosomes between, it's a fusion between, between chromosomes eight and nine. So that was a, a so, so I'm happy to see that. <laughs> and another thing that, that uh, Ingrid did uh, was to just count the number of scaffolds that belong uh, to each uh, chromosome. Of course, uh, most of the scaffolds uh, belong, belong to only one chicken chromosome. And, uh, and, and we knew that uh, repeat content will, will, make, uh, will, will make that the scaffolds will be smaller, but they will be uh, more numerous, right? So uh, it was not a surprise to see that chromosome Z had the, large, the biggest number of scaffolds because chromosome C is a macro chromosome and also has a very high repeat content. Uh, and you can see that, well, the, the, the chromosomes that have the largest number of scaffolds are the macro chromosomes that you may expect. Uh, also, there is a, a pretty much a correlation between chromosome size and the number of scaffolds uh, with the exception of chromosome 11. This is a micro chromosome and the number of scaffolds that it has, uh, it's uh, similar to those of the macrochromosomes. Uh, and, and now we know, after reading a recent one's paper, that what happened is that chromosome 11 in parrots is fused to chromosome Z. So it has um, all these tandem repeats, and that's why we have so many scaffolds of chromosome 11. Uh, if you add up all uh, scaffolds that belong to the same chromosome, uh, now you have a profile that is uh, a better representative of chromosome size. Uh, we, we point out that microchromosomes 10 and 12 are actually uh, have a larger cumulative length than macrochromosome 9. So, uh, something to note. And if you take this uh, cumulative length and, and divide by the number of scaffolds, and then you get the average scaffold size. And now you can see that uh, chromosome Z has a very, very small signal, right? So it, because it has so many repeats. And uh, also uh, similar in the signals is chromosome 11, for good reasons. But then also chromosome 25 is almost as small of them. Chromosome 33 has a, has a bit more. And, and chromosome 25, uh, we found out by the recent paper of Wang, is also fused to these X chromosomes in the monk parakeet only. Uh, but not in the blue-fronted Amazon. So we would not expect it to be uh, fused to the sex chromosomes in the Puerto Rican parrot, but it does have a very small average scaffold size. Uh, so there is a chance that it is uh, fused to the sex chromosomes, but in such a case, it will require a second evolutionary event. Um, uh, Ingrid also did uh, chrom chromosome, uh, chromosome painting using chicken probes. 
uh, and she used chicken probes uh, belonging to uh, the 10 macro chromosomes. And in this example, she has uh, in green is a chromosome nine, in red has chromosome eight, and you can see that there are these two uh, chromosome pairs, are chromosome nine, and there you get, you get also these micro chromosomes, right? That they have green and red. So it looks like uh, there are very small chromosomes that have segments of chromosome eight and chromosome nine. And she did this for all macro chromosomes. And this is a summary of her results. Uh, what you can see is that in uh, uh, it is it is being compared to the scarlet scarlet macaw. In the scarlet macaw, for example, you have the chicken chromosome one has been broken into three segments here, here, and here. In the parrot, you have broken only in two segments. Uh, also, in the scarlet macaw, you have an entire chromosome two. In the parrot, it looks like the chromosome two got broken in about its centromere. This, uh, cr this, chromosome is uh, this chromosome is acrocentric, but then in the, in the Puerto Rican part, you have two pterocentric chromosomes, chromo two, number two chromosomes, right? It's, it's, it's this one over here, and also this very small one over here. And then uh, chromosome four uh, in both species have been broken into two pieces in one piece, you have it is fused to an apparent microchromosome that's here and also here. Uh, but then in Scarlet Macaw, it's fused to one chromosome one piece, and, but it's independent in the in the parrot. You have in both species that there's a chromosome that has alternating segments of chromosome six and seven, here and here. And also you have a fusion of chromosome eight and nine. You have it here in the parrot, and also you have it here in the scar in the scarlet macaw. That is also fused to a piece of chromosome eight, which is absent in the Puerto Rican parrot. The Puerican parrot has chromosome nine, uh, independent, and well, we really we don't see that in, in, in the scarlet macaw. So there are many changes between the scarlet macaw and the Puerto Rican parrot. They diverged uh, approximately 26 million years ago. So that means that there is a lot of uh, a lot of rearrangement in a short period of time. And that is that's something of our concern, right? Because we want to study uh, the genes that are involved in eggshell egg biomineralization and structure uh, using the chicken genome as reference. And we get all these uh, rearrangements. So we need to make sure, we will need to make sure that the genes we, we, we will be studying are actually the genes that are orthologal to the uh, to the chicken genes. Okay, so so that's a that's a that's a challenge that we are facing. We are hypothesizing that there will be uh, some slightly deleterious mutations in some of the genes that uh, are responsible for eggshell uh, biomineralization, uh, and and we cannot approach this by doing uh, genome-wide association studies or any kind of study that requires a large number of samples, uh, because it is a critically endangered species. Uh, however, the Genomics Education Partnership, we know that it aims to integrate uh, active learning in undergraduate curriculum uh, through course-based uh, research, research experiences. And this problem can be approached through GEP. Uh, so I am proposing here a collaborative effort. Uh, as you probably know, I'm retired. I don't care about being a co-author or author of anything, but, but I do care about education and I, and I care about the Puerto Rican parrot. Uh, I have an ad honorem position in our department. Uh, we recently upgraded our scanning electron uh, microscope, which will be very important in this study. Uh, but we don't have facilities for doing uh, CRISPR. And we, we, we are certain that we are going to find some candidate mutations uh, to, to affect protein function among the genes that uh, code for uh, proteins responsible of actual biomineralization. And uh, so we need people who will do CRISPR. Uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to concentrate in the genes, uh, that, in some of the genes that are responsible for actual biomineralization, and also on how GEP works. Okay, uh, the the egg is formed in different parts of the 
uh, hence reproductive system. The oocyte emerges from the ovary together with the yolk. It's fertilized in the infundibulum. And in the magnum, it gets the egg white, uh, egg white proteins, uh, the, the most abundant protein is albumin, as you probably remember. And in the white isthmus, it, the actual membranes get deposited. At the end of the white isthmus, you have the red isthmus, okay? <clears throat> and in, in, in that place, there's the deposition of mam mammillary knobs. They are organic rich, and they are the foundations of, uh, of, of, the, of the mineralized shell. So the eggshell, uh, so, so the egg, uh, when the egg enters the uterus, uh, the egg white gets hydrated. So the egg actually inflates. It acquires its ovoid shape. And uh, uh, more importantly, uh, the actual membrane, membrane, which at this point is the, are the outer part of the egg at this point, uh, gets into close contact with the uterine mucosa. And uh, then the uh, mineralized part of the actual is start, is start to get formed. The actual structure is the, pretty much the same in all birds. It protects the embryo from mechanical shocks. It protects them from microbial contamination. It also allows gaseous exchange at the same time that prevents uh, desiccation. <clears throat> the eggshell is 1.6% water. 3.4% uh, organic uh, materials. Uh, that is including the, we're we are including the actual membrane as part of the eggshell. And the actual membrane is, is, is pretty much everything uh, proteinaceous. And 95% uh, of the eggshell is inorganic material. And that inorganic material is calcite, okay? It's, a, it's the most stable of all uh, carbon, calcium carbonate uh, polymorphs. And I, I'm not a mineralogist, <laughs> but uh, uh, these are different uh, calcite crystals. Uh, they all have a, they all have a, a, some kind of symmetry. They all have the faces, and they all have the C axis. Is this diagonal that you see over here? Okay, uh, we will be talking about that uh, soon. <clears throat> so at the left, you have a scanning electrode micro micrograph of the actual and, and at the right you have a you know a drawing summarizing the actual structure and the uh, actual membrane is composed of the interlacing proteins uh, the most common protein in the in the actual membranes is uh, very rich in cysteine uh, also very common is a uh, collagen type 10 and also lysozyme okay lysozyme has a antimicrobial uh, activity so very early in the process, uh, the hens is securing an environment free of, uh, free of pathogens. And these, uh, and you will find uh, along the whole process, there will be uh, proteins with antimicrobial act uh, activity. <clears throat> so uh, the mammillary knobs, are uh, supporting, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the mammillary knobs are on top of the actual membranes, okay? The actual membranes are, will be supporting the whole, the whole mineralized structure and, uh, uh, and, and any uh, disruption of the actual membrane will prevent a normal mineralization. So the mammillary knobs is, uh, is, are the nucleation sites. They are the starting points of mineralization. So mineralization starts at the, at the mammillary knob and crystallization uh, forms these uh, uh, mammillary cones and the mammillary cones will fuse together to form the palisade, palisade layer, okay? Uh, the, uh, in the mammillary knobs, uh, it, it, uh, massive amounts of amorphous carbonate, calcium carbonate are aggregated, okay? <clears throat> and these uh, amorphous uh, calcium carbonates, uh, which I'm going for, for my uh, convenience, I'm going to say just ACC. Uh, it uh, possesses a, a short range procalcitic uh, structure 
that predetermines uh, its direct conversion into, cal into calcite, okay? And even though uh, there are all kinds of calcium carbonate polymorph in the uterine fluid, eventually only calcite will be formed. And the uh, uterine proteins, they promote the exclusive formation of calcite. And they also uh, play, a, play a role in increasing the number of calcite crystals and also decreasing their size. Uh, among the uterine proteins, there are uh, proteoglycans, and, that, and, there are, and there are glycophosphor proteins, and there are many kinds of proteins there that, that, I can, that they can modify a calcite crystal uh, when they are grown in their presence. And that has an effect on actual strength, okay? So from the mammillary knobs, you have this a, a, a rapid crystal growth uh, and, 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 uh, so, and, and they fuse together to form the palisade layer, as I said, as I said before. And the, uh, this rapid growth ends with this uh, a thin vertical crystal layer. Uh, and on top of that is a lay the cuticle, which is a proteinaceous film that has a lot of antimicrobial activity and that it clogs the mouth of the pores that are uh, in the eggshell. The uh, carbon dioxide is one of the reactants. It comes, uh, uh, it, fuse, it diffuses passively from the bloodstream to the uh, uterine glandular cells. And in the glandular cells, uh, there is a reaction that is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. Uh, that hydrates CO2 to form a uh, bicarbonate. And the bicarbonate is uh, transported uh, outside, extracellularly, to the organic matrix uh, by uh, 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 solute carriers. In the organic matrix, you also have a CA4, carbonic anhydrase 4. This is a membrane bound carbonic anhydrase that has. It uh, has its, uh, its catalytic domain is extracellular. So any carbon dioxide that is found also in the organic matrix uh, will be hydrated and will become also a bicarbonate. And the bicarbonate uh, reacts with calcium to form calcium carbonate. Uh, the calcium uh, comes part of it. 60% uh, of it approximately comes from the bloodstream uh, under the influence of estrogen, the medullary bone uh, releases uh, calcium uh, and this calcium will be transported into the uterine epithelium by calcium transporter like ATP2C2, there are others. Uh, but then uh, about 40% of, uh, of the calcium actually comes from the diet. The, when, when the hen reaches sexual maturity, it develops an appetite for calcium diet. And uh, calcium can come directly from the intestine uh, through a, a paracellular pathway uh, that includes clothings, occludings, uh, junction addition molecules, and tight junction proteins. And also through these paracellular pathways, uh, water is secreted, ion uh, is exchanged, for osmosis uh, regulation, okay? Uh, in addition, uh, this calcium that gets uh, into the uterine epithelium is transported, uh, calbinding is the main transporter, as far as it's known. And during this process, uh, the large amount of calcium inside these cells actually induces the release of more calcium from intracellular reservoirs in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. Uh, uh, through calcium pumps, also vesicles uh, that vesicles that hold uh, calcium carbonate are also are also released and extruded by exocytosis to the organic matrix. Uh, these calcium ions that uh, reach the uh, outer membrane, uh, they are transported out by uh, calcium sodium calcium channels and also by uh, by ATPases, 
and a, and and of course that also provokes that you get a higher amount of protons inside the cells and they are uh, pumped out uh, by ATP six V one C two uh, among others among other pumps uh, and there are uh, I haven't shown here sodium pumps potassium uh, sodium and potassium pumps they are they are there are many of them also here for to uh, to keep homeostasis. Uh, so the the point I'm trying to make, I guess, is that there are many, 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 many players involved here. Okay. On the on the vesicles, uh, the vesicles, uh, you get the annexin uh, that promotes uh, calcium intake into the vesicles. And these vesicles uh, in their inner inner membrane, they also have CA4. So CA4, uh, hydrate CO2, so there will be the carbonate ion and the carbonate ion will react with the calcium to form ACC. So there will be ACC in the, in the vesicle and the vesicle when it comes out uh, to the uterine fluid, it is directed to the mammillary knobs uh, by EZL3, okay? EZL3 uh, has uh, EGF-like domains. Some of the EGF-like domains uh, are calcium binding, others, others are integrin binding. And at the, ter at the carboxy terminal end, they have A5HC domains, which uh, bind to uh, phospho uh, phospholipids. So they, uh, they dock uh, the ves vesicles, and vesicles empty their ACC in the mammalian knobs. So you get ACC throughout the actual membranes, but they are uh, irrigated in the mammillary knobs. And that's where, uh, th those are the nucleation sites, okay? Uh, interestingly, I, I found in a recent paper that either three, even though either three is found in the chicken eggshell, in neo aves, it is not found. But either three exists in neo aves, but it, it, and it's very conserved. Uh, the sequence, but uh, it is it has not been found in the in the actual. So it's there. There is probably an, another gene doing the same work. There are paradoxes of either three, uh, and one of the paradoxes is is, is is also present in the chicken. So it's possible that that paradox is working more in the in the neo aves. Okay? Uh, the mineralization <clears throat> uh, can be uh, divided into three stages. The first stage starts uh, five hours after ovulation and it lasts for five hours. It's called the slow phase uh, because the shell is deposited at a rate of just 0.1 grams per hour. Uh, uh, as I said, there, at that point you get ACC all over the uh, all, all over the actual membrane, uh, but aggregates are the mammary knobs. And at that point, the the crystals, right? The crystals are uh, very small and they are oriented in all directions and that happens for the first two hours but uh, for the next three hours for the last for the last three hours uh, the, the, the mom when the uh, okay here when the mammary when the mammary cone layer is is formed the c axis of these crystals uh, gets progressively oriented perpendicular to the surface okay and there are two reasons for that one of the one of the one of the reasons is competitive growth of adjacent crystals. You know, they they fit better if they are oriented perpendicular to the surface. Uh, but the second reason is organic matrix proteins. Uh, for example, uh, ovoclading uh, seventeen is a is a C type lectin. You know, lectin are recognition proteins, and they recognize certain uh, calcite phases, and they inhibit the growth of crystal phases that are uh, parallel to the surface. Uh, OC17 is specific to birds and it's specific to eggshells. In the second stage, the second stage lasts for 12 hours and it is a rapid growth phase. The shell is deposited at 0.33 grams per hour. It's where the bulk of the shell is deposited. And it starts with the uh, mammary knobs getting fused Okay, and that way they, they, the palisade is born and then the palisade grows very fast. And uh, uh, in, the, in the shell mineralization front, 
there is ACC and uh, there, and there is, okay, okay, there's ACC here and there are uh, proteins that stabilize the ACC and that control uh, morphology and the size of the crystals. And uh, among the proteins that uh, do that work, there are egg white proteins like ovotranscurin and also lysozyme. Lysozyme, as I said before, they, it has antimicrobial properties. Uh, there is also other egg white protein is the ovalbumin. It's actually the most abundant egg white protein. It stabilizes ACC and uh, some SNPs found in uh, ovalbumin have been associated to uh, actual strength and thickness. Uh, there's also osteopontin that by its name, you can figure out that it uh, works in the hydroxypatite mineralization in bone. And, but it also works in the mineralization of calcium carbonate in the eggshell. Uh, it is a phospholipid glycoprotein and uh, it, it, there are there are SNPs that have been found on it that also uh, produce defects in actual mineralization. And then you have ovocladin 116. It is the, the most abundant in the in the actual matrix. And it is found uh, in in uh, it is found in the palisade layer and also in the mammillary cone layer. Uh, it, has a, it has an ortholog in mammals that uh, works in bone mineralization. And SNPs in OC116 has also been found that, uh, that influence actual thickness and actual shape. And then in the, in the terminal phase, uh, it is the last stage, it's two hours long. And at, at that stage, the uh, calcification is arrested. We know very little about that process and the cuticle is deposited. Uh, the, uh, the cuticle has many uh, proteins that uh, have antimicrobial activity. And they also, those proteins also provide the color of the eggshell. Uh, among the proteins, main proteins in the cuticle are the ovocalyxins, it's ovocalyxin 32, uh, which is actually the most abundant protein in the uterine matrix during the first stage, okay? So that's part of the, a, a pathogen-free environment that the hen is providing for the egg. And OCX32 inhibits carbo carboxypeptidase activity. Uh, so inhibits bacterial growth. And uh, ovocalyptin 36 uh, is uh, specific to birds, uh, but it is part of a gene family uh, that is found in mammals and uh, they are key components of the innate uh, immunity systems in mammals, and they provide uh, the first line of defense. Uh, so I have, I have mentioned now a, a few proteins. Uh, proteomic analysis in the chicken uh, has found, a, have counted 904 proteins in the chicken eggshell, okay? And some of those uh, proteins are not found in other studies that in which they, uh, anal they analyze the expression of genes in the uterus and compared bears that will lay eggs or, or chickens that will lay eggs of normal strength with chickens that will lay eggs of low strength. Uh, and they found the uh, differently expressed genes among these type of chickens. And some of the genes are actual genes, but some are not. Like for example, uh, genes that have to do with uh, muscle contraction. And, and, and you, can, you, know, you can think that uh, the uh, muscular contraction can control the time that the uh, egg is in the uterus. And, and the actual takes, uh, it takes 19 hours to be secreted, so uh, so making it too fast can also uh, can also affect actual strength, uh, I think. So uh, there is a uh, in the in the Puerto Rican part of project in GEP. Uh, this is the web page that we are. Uh, well, uh, actually, Wilson is our director of IT. IT as the person who's actually doing this. Uh, this this web page uh, and building it. Uh, uh, 
this uh, GP curricula, uh, you can uh, you can implement it in many different ways. Okay, it's very flexible. You can implement it in a lab, in a, in a, as a lab exercise. Uh, you can imp implement it uh, as an individual undergraduate project. Uh, you can uh, make your own course. Some GP faculty have made their own courses. Uh, so so it, it's very flexible. And the web page will have these, uh, these, uh, these resources and tools over here. They are not yet available to everyone, but they are available to anyone who wants to take a chance with starting this, this, with this project already. Uh, I'm working with it, and there are other professors who are working with it. Uh, so uh, the thing about the, the GP has always worked with insects. It would be the first vertebrates, and vertebrates have many uh, have genes with many, many isoforms. And and but these isoforms uh, very often are just putative. They are not. You know they are predicted, and we are not really sure that they exist. Uh, so we'll, and, and it will be a lot of work to to do them all, and probably it's not worth it if they if they are not real. Uh, so Wilson has found a way to select uh, these uh, isoforms that are being validated or that have been predicted with uh, high confidence by APRIS to be functionally important. Uh, uh, also, we have devised some walkthrough and some exercises, uh, other resources, uh, so that uh, uh, so that students can uh, can study by themselves. We are using them, and we uh, are constantly improving it and updating them. And so we appreciate beta testers. So if you want to join, you're welcome. Uh, there will be, there is a, a, among the resources and tools, well, the faculty resources, there, there's the uh, project claim form. Uh, this is an Excel page. Uh, and in here, you can just claim, you, okay, I have claimed here these two genes. Uh, we uh, want at least two professors claiming uh, for each gene so that we'll get two reports from each gene and we can reconcile them. Uh, before you uh, claim your gene, uh, you can move by uh, this Excel page and you can see that there is uh, some information that will let you know uh, uh, how many exons uh, it has. Uh, and, and, uh, and also uh, the difficulty or that we estimate what will be the difficulty of annotating this gene, okay? Because on many occasions we want, you know, we want to control that as a professor. Uh, so you have this information in advance to make your choice. Uh, you also have this tab over here uh, where you have the selected isoforms uh, for each gene. Uh, and you have the ensemble IDs, you have the RefSeq IDs, you have Uniprod IDs. Uh, and uh, so, so, the, so this is available to the students. Uh, so they, so they can uh, go directly to the sequence of the uh, chicken uh, isoform to annotate it. Uh, we have uh, made a, a workflow, which is right here. <clears throat> In the workflow, uh, you have a, we, you, we have divided uh, the process into four steps. In the, in the first step, on the first stage, if you want, uh, you find the orthologs. In the second stage, you annotate the gene in the parrot. In the third stage, uh, you make an alignment, a close al al omega alignment uh, of the protein sequence of the parrots that you have annotated. Uh, you align it to the chicken sequence and also to the bujerigar, which uh, diverged from the Puerto Rican parrot from 32 million years ago. Uh, and the, the reason is that uh, then you, by inspection, you will look, or the student will look for, uh, for, uh, for those amino acid sites that have been conserved between the, the, between the chicken and the bodgerigar, but that have changed in the Puerto Rican parrot. So those are uh, candidates to be mutation specific to the Puerto Rican parrot. We know that the bodgerigar diverged from the Puerto Rican parrot 32 million years ago. That's a lot of time. Uh, so we are looking for a species that is more closely related to the Puerto Rican parrot. We know now there is a telomere to telomere a gene, a sequence genome of Amazona aestiva, which diverged from the Puerto Rican parrot 
seven million years ago. So it will be a, so that will be preferable, but at this moment it's still not available. Uh, after the students identify those amino acid sites where there are a Puerto Rican part of specific mutations, then the students uh, interrogate uh, programs that predict the effect of an amino acid change in protein function. Uh, we use a SIFT, that's a sorting intolerant from tolerant, and we also use polyphen 2. Uh, and then uh, if there are, if, this, if some of those mutations are actually predicted to be, uh, to be, to affect protein function, then they are, uh, then the students must look at the Hispaniolan parrot. We have the Hispaniolan parrot genome also. This Hispaniolan parrot is a sister species of Puerto Rican parrot. It diverged about 0 0.6 million years ago. So it's really the best one. The only thing is that it is very, very bad assembly. <laughs> And, and about half of the time, uh, we don't find we, we we don't find the the site in the in the uh, in the Hispaniolan assembly. In those cases, we can look in the Amazon Estiva, which is uh, seven million years apart, and and so we will always find someone to to, to compare it. So the, the the students spends most of their time in the first two stages in in making sure that they have the right gene, and then annotating it. In the in the first stage, uh, the the first step is is to find the the chromosome location of the gene in the in the chicken, uh, and then uh, they also do define the genomic neighborhood, and that's because we assign ortology based on chromosome location and synteny. Uh, Wilson has used the Amazona Estiva assembly to assemble the Puerto Rican parrot scaffolds. In a new assembly, which is this Amabit NT joint two, and uh, if you let's say I am I'm looking for an octamine three, uh, I just need to put the symbol here in the search box, and it automatically uh, makes a a blood alignment against transcripts. In this case, you find you find against transcripts transcripts of these four different species. Uh, the closest species to the parrot is Cacapo, which is a parrot. It's a, it's a very distantly related parrot. It's about 42 million years apart. It is the, the most uh, oldest branch of the parrots. Uh, and it tells, uh, gives you four transcripts always uh, on, in the assembly NT joint two. Okay? And then you have the songbird, uh, Parus major, this is the great tit, uh, also NT joint two. And then the other two species, emu and chicken, a more uh, further related. Uh, they give you also matches to NT join two, but also to some other places that are probably parallel. So the, the, uh, the, 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 there's a good chance that the gene I'm looking for is in NT join two. Okay? So uh, the next uh, step uh, is, a, is a you click of one of the validated transcripts. Uh, you get to the browser and it has uh, several evidence uh, tracks. Uh, one of the very first ones are the gaps. You can see that there are many, many gaps here. <clears throat> and that's another problem that the uh, Puerto Rican parrot assembly has uh, several gaps. And uh, uh, to, to solve this problem, uh, we are actually having the Puerto Rican parrot genome being resequenced at UConn. Uh, we use the nanomore program called org1. Org1 uh, aims to uh, sequence the genome of uh, endangered species. So they are very happy to help us on this. And Yukon is one of their collaborators, is one of their partners, and they are sequencing the Puerto Rican Paro genome right now with Prometheon technology, which is direct sequencing. That means that they need very little material. The thing is that in the in the Puerto Rican parrot, uh, a dead embryo was used. Uh, so DNA uh, DNA regions uh, that were in relaxed chromatin, like those that are at the beginning of many genes, uh, got degraded, and we find that about half of the genes that we are annotating are missing their first exon. So that's something that we hope to overcome uh, shortly. So going back to, to the browser that we see here, we see, we see NT join two. 
uh, you can see that uh, in the Puerto Rican assembly, we are looking at scaffold number 328. <clears throat> And you would remember that Ingrid did blood alignments of these scaffolds against the chicken chromosome. So we have a table uh, where it make the conversion from the scaffold to the chicken chromosome. So you can quickly find uh, we, in which uh, chicken chromosome uh, you are here, we, which chicken chromosome is autologous to this place. And, uh, and that table is available in the web page. Uh, this uh, zero over here, you see, where is my course? Oh, okay. This zero, this zero that you see over here, uh, it, it means that <clears throat> it means that the uh, the first base of the scaffold in the anti joint assembly is the first base of the scaffold. Okay, uh, and that, that is not always the case because uh, there are some cases in which there have been misassemblies, or if there is a, a rearrangement between Amazona estiva and Amazona vitata, that will happen also. Okay, so it, so it can be a, a real rearrangement. Uh, other evidence tracks, okay, I'm, I'm zooming in here so you can see better the evidence tracks. Uh, over here you have you have span alignment to uh, chicken proteins in RevSeq, in Ensemble, and in Uniprot. Uh, you have uh, blood alignments to uh, chicken transcripts. Uh, you have predictors, gene predictors. And then you have RNA-seq. RNA-seq is also deficient, uh, but we are also uh, having uh, more RNA sequenced. Uh, this RNA and the and the DNA that is being resequenced come from blood from an adult, uh, from a live adult. And uh, actually, it was a, a, a it was a sent directly, and, and in, after one day, it was already being subjected to to see, to, uh, to the in, to the process. Um, uh, okay, so, so those are the tracks that you find. And uh, by, by zooming out, uh, you can now have the, the gene here uh, and, and you can see it in different, uh, different databases. Uh, so you can quickly uh, find out which are the neighboring genes. Uh, we are, we, uh, because there are so many paradoxes and so many rearrangements, we are asking for the four genes that are upstream and four genes that are downstream of each, uh, of each target gene. And we do the same in the, in the chicken. And to do the same in the chicken, Wilson has placed a, a gene record finder in the web page. Uh, in this gene record finder, uh, it gets you directly to the NCBI gene page where you have the map of the, uh, of the the DNA region where the gene is, and you can control the, you can zoom in and zoom out, and you can quickly see also which are the genes that are neighboring it. Uh, at the bottom of this uh, page, uh, you have the isoforms of this, uh, of this gene, different isoforms. Uh, of course, we are analyzing only the ones that validated out these ends over here. Uh, and then you have the colon, the exons, sorry, you have the exons. Uh, these are coding exons because we have polypeptide details. If you press here, transcript details, you get all exons, coding and non-coding exons. And on the bottom here, you have this table where you have a, for each exon where it ends, where it, where it starts and ends in the chicken. You have the strand, you have the phase. The phase is the number of nucleotides uh, uh, that, uh, that are after the acceptor site that need to be joined together to the nucleotides from the previous exon to form a colon, okay? So the phase will always be zero, one, or two. And the first uh, exon will always be phase zero, will always be phase zero because it doesn't have to, you always start with a full colon, ATG, with a methionine colon. And, and then it gives you also the size of the, of the, uh, of the exon. And the sequence, so you can <clears throat> the student can take this sequence and uh, carry it to the blast X alignment. Uh, he can use it uh, as the as the subject in the blast X alignment, and then in the uh, in the query, it puts the the student uh, put the DNA sequence of the part of scaffold, and he will get uh, the results. and And then he can use it, like for example, in here. <clears throat> Can use the co coordinates of the query to go directly to the browser of the <clears throat> of the assembly of the Puerto Rican parrot assembly. Okay, so, so you, you see here where it is in frame one, 
And in frame one, you have this amino acid sequence that you can see that it's right here. And before that, you have the acceptor site. Here is the AG. And before that, you have the uh, periodine bridge tract here. Uh, so so uh, in, and in, in this case, uh, well, uh, the first uh, full column is this, is this losing called by TTG. So you have, you have phase two, right? You have two, two bases here that are that need to be joined together to the first to the last nucleotide of the previous exon to form one one column. Uh, after so the students uh, joins all the exons, uh, and then it, it can test their module in a gene model checker that is present uh, also in the web page. In this gene model checker, uh, you just tell the, the program that you are this Amazon Habitata, you tell about which is the scaffold and which is the gene. Uh, you put the coordinates and you tell them the strand and also if you have it complete or not. Uh, and, and you have this top column here, okay? And it and checks for having a start column, checks for every donor site, checks for every acceptor site, checks for a stop column also, and it checks that the frames are open. And it also gives you a magnifying glass. So if, if the if the student uh, missed uh, an acceptor site, just by pressing here, the magnifying glass will get will get it directly to the point in the genome browser where that uh, mistake uh, was uh, made. Also, the gene model checker it has a tab here for dot plot. In the dot plot, uh, in the x-axis, you have the chicken sequence. In the y-axis, you have the power sequence. And this uh, continuous diagonal uh, tells you that the sequence is very, very conserved. Uh, these, uh, these, are, these other dots here are, they are, they are the, they indicate that there are internal repetitive sequences, you can see it here too. And uh, the colored columns, they represent exons in the chicken sequence, and the colored rows represent exons in the parrot sequence. And that's very good because if the student chooses the wrong splicing site, let's say it chooses the wrong acceptor site or the wrong donor site, what's going to happen is that the diagonal will get interrupted right in the front line between exons. And you will see that, and you can confirm that by a, a sequence alignment that also the gene model checker produces, well, it uh, highlights the exons with different colors, okay? So the first exons ends, the first exon ends right here, and here, this is the second exon, and ends right here. So you will expect that the exons will start and end at the same points in both sequences. Uh, usually, that would, that's what's going to happen. Um, when it doesn't happen, usually it's a mistake by the student. Okay, and so eventually uh, you want the student to do the crosstal omega alignment. So this is an example in, on like, the oxytocin receptor. Uh, and in this case, you have four amino acid sites where uh, the site is conserved between the chicken and the uh, Bob Jerry gar. That, that's a Australian parakeet. And uh, but there is a variant in Amazon Evitata, right? So these become candidates to be uh, mutations that are specific to Amazon Evitata. And uh, you can go to SIFT, okay? The SIFT program. The SIFT program, uh, you uh, put the data and it will make, a, it will make, an, make an evaluation on how uh, uh, how frequent these mutations appeared in evolution, right? So it would make alignments of all the, in all the database that it has. Uh, often it doesn't have much uh, information at the beginning of the sequence, and also at the end of the sequence happens at the same time. So it will eventually give you the, these uh, results. So in this case, for example, uh, the first amino acid is methionine, the second is uh, in, in the chicken sequence, the, the second is a uh, glutamic acid and so on. And this column is the representation in the in, in the alignment that I just showed you. Okay, so this is a very this is a very low number, so they have very little representation there. So it will be any any determination will have low confidence, and on the right are the are the uh, substitutions that will be tolerated, and on the left those that will not be tolerated. 
And it will tell you for exactly for the four mutations that I, for the, all changes that I put over there, uh, three of them were tolerated, one affects protein function, and it gives you the only warning when there is a low confidence on there. Okay, so eventually that's what I will do. Now students will need to do is to take this, this uh, look for this mutation also in Amazon ventralis in the Hispaniola and Parrot, which I can tell you now that uh, also has the same change. So it's not specific to the Puerto Rican Parrot. Uh, so that will be the, the report. So the students will eventually, ah, and I forgot to tell you, the gene model checker also produces a GFF file that gives you the coordinates. It produces a transcript, a FASTA file that has the transcript sequence and produce a PET file that has the protein sequence. Uh, uh, so those three files together with the gene report are uh, sent to the GP for reconciliation. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop here. <laughs>